one. This happened long before Homo sapiens Karen was taxonomically described, but this county could well be named Karen Co. For all the arrogance and entitlement this affluent enclave is renowned for, a lot of people here just suck. I taught part-time at the local community college, which means I only get paid for the time I teach. Extracurriculars are at my discretion. The semester's over, but I had to pick something up. I went to say hi to the department secretary, whom I was friends with. She says, I know it's not your responsibility, but could you please contact this kid who's interested in taking the beginning class, but wants some information? Frank's not getting back to him, as usual, and I feel bad for him. Okay, sure. Have him email me and I'll do what I can. He emails me that he's a high school student in the program that allows him to take one college class. He's trying to decide between astronomy and my class, and would I call him so he could ask questions. I don't want him to have my phone number, and I started a job with long hours where I wasn't getting home until around midnight. Plus, if he's demanding now, what's it going to be like in the class? I emailed him the detailed class syllabus that lays out the entire semester with every assignment and the due dates listed. I hated instructors who couldn't stick to the syllabus, so I always made sure mine was accurate. I tell him to feel free to email me any further questions. He responds that he really needs to talk to me without elaborating why. I email him back that the syllabus is comprehensive and self-explanatory, but email me any specific questions. I ended with... Here's some friendly advice. It's a little rude to keep insisting on a private call after someone has expressed a clear preference for email. The next night, I get home exhausted and just want to go to bed. Of course, there's an email, but it's from his mother. It is not rude to ask for a phone call, but wise. My son wasn't rude. You were. You lack self-respect and intelligence. I will be forwarding this to your department chair, Dr. So-and-so. You're unfit to teach, and I'll make sure you don't anymore. This is the bullet point version. It was long and poorly written. Laughable, really. I wasn't angry, per se, but just annoyed enough to not let it slide. It's a character flaw. I try not to indulge, but sometimes I just can't help it. I wrote, please stop with your petty threats. It's laughable, and you're embarrassing yourself. If my job is contingent on approval from an obnoxious parent like you, I will quit. I'm on summer vacation. I'm not getting paid for this. I didn't have to respond to your son at all, but did so as a courtesy. Under no circumstances whatsoever do I owe anyone a phone call. As for my self-respect, I have enough not to cater to a parent with an inflated sense of entitlement and self-importance. I don't care if your son takes my class or not. It makes no difference to me. I have no shortage of students wanting to take my class. Then comes the gratuitous, somewhat cheap shot I couldn't resist once I thought of it. Your son will be better off taking astronomy, where he will learn he's not the center of the universe. You should take it with him. The kid probably didn't deserve that, but, oh well, his mother did. Coda. At next semester's faculty, I apologized to the chair if I caused any problems, but she irked me. He laughed and said, I could tell, I could tell. Impressive. He said it was no big deal, that they get angry parents all the time. He noticed the mother and son had different last names, so she was probably the stepmother who pushed him about calling and took it out on me when I told him he was rude. He read the emails and could see I was trying to help him. The secretary said, I'm so sorry I asked you to contact him. You went out of your way and that was your reward. I told her it was okay. I kind of had fun with it, which made her burst out laughing. 2. At the time of these events, we live in a nice house on a cul-de-sac up on the hill with a great view of the valley and the lake. Our property is long and narrow. It is about twice as long as any other lot on the street. But instead of a big backyard, it has a really long side yard that extends to the corner of the cul-de-sac with the main road. It is mostly grass, but there is a cluster of scrub oak and a flower garden that takes up the last 12 to 15 feet of it. After the scrub oak is a chain-link fence. And beyond that is the site of the next house down the hill on the main road. You can see their driveway and backyard from the middle of the scrub oak cluster. This is all important. The reason it is important is because these neighbors have chickens and a rooster. When we moved in, there were a lot of failed flowering plants on the property. 
The only non-weed growing in abundance in this side yard flower garden were iris. I swear you can grow an iris anywhere. But they're not the longest lived flowers in the world. My beautiful wife had great plans for this space, but she knew she needed to start with some small plants. As they grew, the rest of the plants could develop. She started with some animals that could start to reclaim the land from the weeds, and some ground covers that, as they progressed, would help choke out the unwanted grasses. She knew it would take some time, but she had done it all before. It would eventually involve peonies, hibiscus, clematis, crocus, tulips, hostas, marigold, and petunias, layered so that the taller plants back the shorter ones. But imagine her surprise when she goes to plant another round just to find a fair number of the small first ones have been trampled and crushed. It was thoroughly disheartening. So she buys some more and plants them, only to find them crushed and trampled as well a few days later. And it repeats. She is starting to feel like it is a waste of money to plant anything in this area. And finally, we discover what is happening. We catch the daughter of the people the two houses down the circle from us, with her toddler son in a stroller, pushing him up to the chain-link fence without any concern about what damage she and the stroller do. What do you think you're doing in my garden? My son wants to see the chickens. They gave us permission to see them any time we want. Great, then go see them. We are. Not here, you're not. They gave us permission. Then go to their house. That's too far, and then I'll have to push him back up the hill from there. He can see them just fine from here. Except you don't have permission to be here. They gave me permission. No, they didn't. They can't give permission for my property. Don't you see what you're doing to my plants? <laughs> These weeds? Look closer, you have destroyed five new little plants that I pay good money for. And not for you to run them over with your stroller. And that's just today. And I have to replant them five times now. I only see weeds. It doesn't matter what you see, you're not welcome here. You are trespassing on my property. If you want to go see the chickens, go to their house and see the chickens. But stay out of my garden. If I see you here again, I will have the police explain it to you. And my beautiful wife sent her away, while she complained the whole way back to the street. And that was the end of it, because entitled people give up on their entitlements just like that. Right? You, dear listener, are much too wise to believe that. Of course, we keep finding our plants destroyed. We start to see ruts from the lawn from the frequent crossing of the stroller over it. We catch them sometimes and repel them. They still keep going to see the chickens. From what we can tell, it is at least daily, and possibly several times a day. We both work. There are a few windows that see out the house in that direction. If we see her going down the street in front of our house from the kitchen, we can block her. When she keeps coming back, she always claims to have permission. We always inform her that she does not. She never pays for the damage that she also never acknowledges happened. We talk to the police about it. They gave her a stern warning, but it does nothing to deter her. And clearly it does not scare her. We can't tell if she's just too stoned to care or has some other glitch that blocks her from getting the message. She is relentless. I only wish that motion-activated sprinklers were a thing when this was going on. It would have been a perfect use for them. Finally, one day, she just stops appearing. The ruts start to heal. My beautiful wife cautiously plants a few cheap starters, and they take. Some time later, in conversing with the owner of the chickens, we learn that she is serving time. Apparently, she was using a great deal and variety of illegal substances, and she had been caught holding enough stuff for them to take it fairly seriously. Her beautiful little boy still lives there. Grandma is raising him now. And they drive down about once a week so he can see the chickens. And he is also good with the chicks. Clearly, we never got through the fog in her mind and understanding that she did not have permission. But we never see her again while we live here. 3. Alrighty, a little bit of background info. I'm 20, I'm Jewish, I work in a toy store at my local mall. So, the Get Your Photo with Santa thing is right in front of the toy store at the mall I work at. Which makes sense. Kids can look around while their parents wait in line. Parents can look for present ideas while their kids wait in line. They can all come in together after getting their photos taken, etc. 
This happened today at around 11 a.m. I had been working at the toy store and my boss let me know I can go on my break. So I do. I had about 30 minutes to kill and I wasn't particularly hungry. But when I walked by the Santa exhibit, I saw that there was almost no lineup because it was a weekday in the middle of the day. Most kids are at school and most parents are working. So, since I'm an adult and don't celebrate Christmas, I thought a picture of me on Santa's lap would be a funny gift to give my family on Hanukkah when I'm home. So I get in line. There's one family who currently has their kids seeing Santa, one kid in front of me, and not long after our entitled mother, entitled father, and their kids. They were all very lovely at first. We made a bit of small talk while we waited. I asked the kids how excited they were to see Santa, etc. The family in front of me goes, and in hindsight, I think the gears were starting to turn in the mother's head, that I wasn't just an older sibling and was actually there for myself. The family in front of me leaves. I get to tell the patron saint of prostitutes, no seriously look it up, what I want for the holiday, I don't celebrate, and I get my pictures. I go back to work and clock back in, because even without the lineup, just waiting for two families and getting the pictures printed and paid for, took most of my lunch break, and a few minutes later the family from before comes in. The kids go off to look at toys, I give them a friendly little, hi again, and I'm met with a very cold-hearted, hello, from the mother. Our store wasn't very busy either, given the day of the week and time of day, so while they browsed, I was showing my co-workers and boss the pictures that I got for shits and giggles, and the mom stumps over like I just shit in her figgy pudding. I'm sorry, I just think it's very rude and immature to keep my kids waiting longer, just for a joke. There was no wait, at least not to see Santa. You're too old to believe in this crap. Keep in mind, her kids were the only kids in the store, and she was yelling. I've never believed in it, I don't celebrate Christmas. A little quieter because I'm actually capable of being courteous. Well, that's the whole other reason why you shouldn't have been there. You're ruining it for everyone else. Well, it doesn't really matter. Santa says I'm on the nice list, and his word is law. I was very obviously screwing with them the whole time. It's a weird coping mechanism where I try to escape conflict by being funny. She then tells me God says I'm going to burn in hell and uses an awful slur people like her use for gay people. I'm Jewish. We don't have a hell. This isn't entirely true, I don't think. I'm not particularly religious, but I know some sects of Judaism say we don't have a hell. Others believe it's more of a temporary thing where you spend time atoning and then get to go to heaven. I was just using the best comeback I could think of. My boss then steps in. All right, I'm going to need you to leave if you're going to keep harassing my employee. The kids came back to find their parents. One asked if they could have one of the candy canes we have at our checkout counter. The mom said no. I said they were free and to go ahead. Both kids took a candy cane because free candy totally outweighs their mother's word, which is actually kind of a scary thought without context. The mom stared daggers at me, called me a name that rhymes with bike, and they left. And I smirked and gave them a very happy Merry Christmas. My boss and co-workers were still laughing with me as I wrote this. We call them Kanye's parents for, well, obvious reasons. 4. So this just happened last night. And I still can't believe someone would do this. I'm a 30-year-old male and a paramedic. I've been an EMS for the past 8 years, and I absolutely love my job. Last night we were dispatched to a 75-year-old female who fell at home. The patient stated that she tripped over her carpet and hit her head when she fell. We arrived on the scene and noticed that the home was a duplex, with our patient's door on the right and her neighbor's door on the left. We made our way into the home and found her lying on the floor. The woman was awake and breathing. We started asking her the standard questions. Are you okay? Does anything hurt? Do you remember the fall? Etc. She stated that she has a pounding headache and that she remembers walking to bed and then waking up on the floor. In my field, that's a pretty big red flag. We notice that she's got a pretty good lump on the side of her head and a big bruise starting to form already. Noticing the bruise, I asked her if she was on any blood thinners. She said that she was on blood thinners for a previous stroke she had a few years ago. We urged her to let us take her to the hospital because there was a possibility that the fall would have caused a bleed in her brain. 
and she could go to the hospital to get some scans done. She agrees, and we begin to package her up. We applied a C collar around her neck in case of any spine or neck injuries. She denied any neck or back pain, so we lifted her up and placed her on our stair chair. A stair chair is exactly what it sounds like. It's a chair with tracks that we use to carry patients up and down stairs. As we were getting her out of the house, her neighbor whipped her door open and started yelling about how she couldn't sleep with all the lights and noises outside. The sound of the stair chair apparently woke her up, and she was not happy about that. My lieutenant walked over to her and apologized and said that we are dealing with a medical emergency and that we would be leaving soon enough. The Karen neighbor then noticed that our patient was her neighbor, and that's when she started yelling about something totally different. The entitled neighbor started yelling, You can't take her to the hospital. I have errands to run tomorrow and she needs to watch my kids. My lieutenant reiterated that we were here for a medical emergency, and that our patient's health is more important than her errands. The entitled neighbor let out a loud huff and then slammed the door in his face. We thought that was the end of it. We were wrong. After a few minutes in the back of the ambulance, we told our lieutenant that he could take the engine crew back to the station and that we were going to be heading out in a few minutes. After we checked her vitals, we got an IV going and started giving her IV fluids. My partner got out of the back and went to the driver's seat. About five seconds later, the back doors of my ambulance fly open, and who do I see? The entitled neighbor, of course. Apparently, she needed a few minutes to get dressed before coming outside. I yelled at her, what the hell do you think you're doing? I told you she can't go to the hospital because she has to watch my kids tomorrow. She then starts trying to pull the cot out of the ambulance with our patient in it. Luckily, she didn't know how to unlatch the cot and couldn't get her out. Our patient says, I can't watch your kiss tomorrow because I fell and I might be having a stroke. The entitled neighbor yells back at her and says, You're fine. You don't need to go to the hospital because you're not having a stroke. My partner then hears the commotion and goes to the back of the ambulance. He pulls her off the cot and I slam and lock the doors. You could tell that the entitled neighbor was about to become more combative. It's important to know that either the police department or the sheriff's department responds to our calls too, when it's at night. Because of where we were, it took a few minutes for the sheriff's department to show up on the scene. But he got there just in time. I couldn't hear much through the door, but I saw the officer get out of his cruiser with his taser drawn. My partner runs back up to the driver's seat and starts heading to the hospital. The last thing I saw through the back windows was the entitled neighbor stomping towards the officer and then her hitting the ground after being tased. Super satisfying to watch. I was talking with my patient and asked what all that was about, and she said that the entitled neighbor will just drop off her three young kids at her house and leave for several hours at a time with no notice. My patient had no idea that she was supposed to watch the kids at all because, again, the entitled neighbor never even gives her a heads up about these things. A little while later, my contact at the hospital said that the patient does not have a bleed. She does, however, have a really nasty-looking bruise on her face from the blood thinners. It's incredibly common. She will most likely be going home soon. Eventually, I got in touch with the officer on that call, and he said that the woman was not formally charged with anything. The patient was back home by then and resting comfortably. Like I said before, the hospital found no signs of bleed, and she was discharged the next day. She was advised to file for an order of protection from the neighbor, but I don't believe I will ever be privy to that information, unless something happens again. 5. This happened early last year when I used to work at a kid's cafe. Think indoor playground with a coffee kiosk for rich people. Basically, on weekdays, we would have our long programs. It would be 30 minutes of an activity, such as story time, crafting, board games, etc., and 30 minutes of playtime in the playground. On the weekends, we would do a two-hour-long themed camp program, where we would only do activities for the full two hours, no playing in the playground. At work, I would always look busy when parents came to drop off kids or pick up kids. We are supposed to cheerfully greet kids as they come in, then give parents feedback about how their kid did when they leave. But the thing about giving feedback, we have to lie, 
We are not allowed to say anything negative about the child's behavior, so... I generally avoided speaking to parents because I don't give a fuck. And I think parents should know the truth. But I also wanted to keep my job and not get reprimanded for breaking a company rule. One Saturday, I was in charge of leading a camp. For camp, we had scripts that we should follow. It was the very end of the camp and all the parents were waiting outside to pick up their kids. The cafe is located in a shopping mall and our walls were giant glass panels, so everyone could see into the cafe. We were doing the last activity, which was to save the cute forest animals from a fire. The kids would take turns being a firefighter and run up and choose one animal to save then bring it back and put it in the basket. I was sitting, holding the basket with one hand and the script in the other. Two kids were left. I told the entitled kid, age eight, to run up and save one animal. He grabbed two animals, so I told him, no, only one animal, please. He rolled his eyes and tossed the other animal to the side. Came down to put his animal in the basket. He asked to go again. I told him he could not because we had one more person who hadn't gone, and it was almost time to go home anyway. He pouted and smacked the script out of my hand, then laughed loudly. I was so annoyed I grabbed his hand and told him to pick up the script and give it to me nicely. He did, and I proceeded to tell him his behavior was not nice and to go sit down. He started crying and sat down. I continued with the activity while he kept crying. My co-workers tried to comfort him, but he would ignore them and throw the candy they offered him. So my manager came and told me to apologize to him for making him cry. I told her I didn't do anything to make him cry, he's just spoiled. The manager walks away, so I started to clean up the activity area. The manager came back and told me entitled kid's parents were upset I made them cry and demanded I apologize. I look over and see entitled parents comforting entitled kid, so I loudly ask if they witnessed his behavior. My manager said yes, but I was at fault for not comforting Entitled Kid after reprimanding him. I loudly, so that the parents could hear, told her I did not reprimand him. I told him to give me the script and told him what he did was not nice. The Entitled Parents called over my manager and told my manager they would not be coming back to a facility with cruel employees who would bully a kid like that. They threatened to leave a bad review. My manager apologized so many times. The parents told her they would accept an apology from me, to them, and E.K. I refused and told them maybe if their child had some manners we wouldn't be where we are now. The mother was very upset by what I said. The dad didn't react much. They grabbed their things and left. My manager told me that I should know better and that I needed to read up on the company's policies and rules about how to deal with parents. The very next weekend, the kid came back and talked to me like nothing ever happened. So did I. I don't hold grudges against kids. The entitled parents, on the other hand, asked the manager to ask me if I have something against their kid. So again, I said loud enough for the parents to hear, kids can't teach themselves manners or how to behave properly. The parents need to do that. Of course, I don't have a problem with the entitled kid. The parents just looked at each other and left before my manager could approach them. I didn't have any problems with the kid that day, but I did hear from my co-workers that the entitled parents asked my manager what days I didn't work to bring entitled kid in in those days. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to the Impractical Proudness of Parents. Hi, Pop. Episode 99. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Please do smack the like button before you leave if you'd be so kind. Okay, let's see. Okay, now we have a couple of birthday shoutouts in a second, but before we go on, we have a shout-out to the author of story number three, and that is Okuro Ishimoto. Thank you very much for allowing us to use your story, Okuro. Doo -doo -doo. Oh, we have two birthday shoutouts to do today. These were for a couple of days ago, but my videos were already uploaded, so we'll do them just now. And today's birthday shoutouts go to Cheese, and this comes from your friend Sophia. And the second one goes to Taylor. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Taylor's birth was on the 30th, and I believe Cheese was on the 1st, which is actually the day I'm recording this. So a very happy birthday to both of you, and may you celebrate all the way through January and spoil yourself, start the year as you mean to go on, that's what I say. 
And before we go, I'd like to sing happy birthday to you both. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Cheese. Dear Taylor. Happy birthday to you. Alrighty, before we go, let's move on to Hellfreezer's question of the day. Uh, today's question is, what is the most weird, inexplicable, if you're comfortable sharing, letter you've ever received? I got one in last week telling me that I was excused from jury duty due to a medical certificate that I have submitted. The only confusing part there is while I would love to be excused from it and if they want to, that's great, I'll accept the excusal, I didn't actually submit a medical exemption certificate. I did contact them, ask what the situation was, they say according to the records I am excused, uh, but I don't want to take someone else's exemption if someone actually needs it medically. So I did send them an email, which I was requested to do, and I'm waiting on a response back. So that's probably the weirdest one, and that was, a, that was an interesting way to end out the year. Uh, I meant to show up next Monday for jury selection, so I guess we'll see what happens. But uh, if, you feel, if you feel comfortable sharing, then please do leave your answers in a comment below. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourself.